Hi everyone, and welcome to the next installment of Linear Algebra 2. So, today we want to take a slightly different perspective on things and look at eigenvectors and eigenvalues. So one of the key aims in this course is to try and find efficient ways to study linear transformations. And we think of linear transformations as things that are some skewing and stretching and rescaling of standard vector spaces or Euclidean space. Um, let's try and make that a bit straighter. And this gets mapped to something. And in general, these are represented by um, some matrix when we're working with respect to some basis. And there's certain very simple to understand transformations are just um, things where we stretch each coordinate by a fixed number. So these are diagonal matrices or stretching each coordinate by a fixed bound. Um, so somehow these are the simplest um, linear transformations to understand, but whether it looks like stretching each coordinate by a fixed amount depends on the choice of basis. Um, if you're stretching just the say z direction in the xyz plane by a factor of two, um, this is very easy to understand if you're working in xyz coordinates, but if you had some different basis that didn't have the z direction as a, um, as a basis element, then this would have a rather more complicated matrix representation. And so there's an actual question um, which linear transformations correspond to these simple transformations, um, simple matrices, with respect to some basis. Um, it might be that we have some linear transformation and we're given a matrix representation for it and it looks very complicated, but if we just change basis to a nice basis, then it would become a um, diagonal matrix and actually it would be therefore a very simple to understand transformation because it's just stretching um, different vectors by different fixed quantities. And that's the whole point of looking at eigenvectors and eigenvalues. It's trying to choose a nice basis so we can understand much more simply certain um, transformations. So that's maybe a bit of, again, geometric style heuristic motivation. Um, so, but now let's move on to some definitions. So let T be a linear transformation. of a vector space V and I'm thinking of this as being of the reals. Then we have following definitions a vector V in V is called an eigenvector. <coughs> 
of the linear transformation t if t times v is just some simple scaled version of the vector v. So tv is lambda times v for some constant scalar lambda, which is just a real number. And correspondingly, lambda as some real number is an eigenvector of t if tv equals lambda v for some vector v in our vector space and okay this would hold always when v is just the trivial vector zero so it has to be some non-zero vector in the vector space. So this is our definition of eigenvector and eigenvalue um, Sorry, lambda is called an eigenvalue of t if it's the constant corresponding to an eigenvector. And maybe our first proposition is going to be starting to get some properties of eigenvalues of t and how they correspond to properties of determinants. So lambda is an eigenvalue of t is equivalent to um, the kernel of the meat of the linear transformation t minus lambda times the identity not being equal to just the trivial set. So this linear transformation doesn't have trivial normality. So here I will call I is defined to be the identity transformation which has uh, just the identity matrix as its matrix representation for any basis. So the proof of this is quite straightforward, but it's allowing us to start getting a feeling for um, why eigenvalues and eigenvectors crop up. So lambda is an eigenvalue of t. Well, we just repeating the definition. This means that t times v is equal to lambda v for some v which is non-zero but lambda v is what v goes to under lambda times the identity so that means that taking it over to the other side t minus lambda i if i apply that transformation to v i do get a zero vector some non-zero v but that means that this non-zero vector v is in the kernel of the linear transformation and so i have non-trivial nullity and the kernel of t minus lambda i is not just the zero vector um, we have at least v in this kernel and so that completes the proof of the proposition. So that's maybe a first key property of eigenvalues that it corresponds to the kernel of t minus lambda i being rather larger than we would typically expect. And then as a corollary, we can list actually several different um, equivalent definitions for lambda being an eigenvalue. So the following are equivalent. So statement A is that lambda is 
an eigenvalue um, of the linear transformation T. Statement B is what we just had above, that the kernel of T minus lambda I is non-trivial. Statement C is that the linear transformation T minus lambda I is not invertible. And statement D is that the determinant of T minus lambda I is equal to zero as a linear map. And the proof of this is actually exceptionally straightforward because we've basically done all the hard work already. So A is equivalent to B is the proposition above. Um, that C is equivalent to D um, is just saying that the determinant being zero is equivalent to a linear transformation not being invertible and that was what we established last lecture. Um, so we know that A is equivalent to B, we know that C is equivalent to D, we just need to link them up. And B is equivalent to C, it's the only thing where we have to do um, any work. And here we just use the rank Nanty theorem. So by the rank Nanty theorem, so this is one of the important results in linear algebra one, saying that the uh, size of the image and the dimension of the image plus the dimension of the kernel has to add up to the dimension of the ambient space. Um, that certainly means that if you're invertible, the dimension of the image has to be everything, so the dimension of the kernel has to be zero. Um, A is invertible if and only if the kernel of A is not just the zero vector. But that gives um, precisely what we wanted, the equivalence um, between B and C. And so that completes the proof of the corollary. So we've already therefore got four different statements that are all equivalent to lambda being an eigenvector. Um, I'd like to just extend this notion of being an eigenvector a little bit further by introducing a definition, which is that of the characteristic polynomial now. So another definition, the characteristic polynomial of, well, let's start off with a matrix A is, so I write it as, so it's a function, which I'm writing chi A of a parameter T, and it's just the determinant of A minus T times the identity matrix. Um, and similarly, we define the characteristics, the characteristic polynomial polynomial of a linear transformation T is chi t of t, which is um, chi a of t for 
any choice of a matrix A representing T with respect to some basis. So whenever we have one of these definitions of defining something for a linear map, we normally define it in terms of what we do with the matrix, because that's how we actually calculate things. But then we need to check that this doesn't depend on the choice of basis, because the matrix representing the linear transformation um, does depend on the choice of basis. So note, chi t if t is well defined, Um, if A and B represent T with respect to different bases, then we know that B is P inverse AP for some change of basis matrix P. So the determinant of B minus T times I N is equal to the determinant of P inverse A P minus T times I N. But then the trick is to notice that this is equal to the determinant of P inverse A minus T times I N times p, because we can just multiply this out, and we know that p inverse i n times p is equal to i n. And this is, by multiplicativity of the determinant, equal to the determinant of a minus t times i n. So the characteristic polynomial doesn't depend on the choice of basis because it's actually always the same. Okay, so we've now introduced this characteristic polynomial and it shouldn't come as a surprise to you that the characteristic polynomial is very closely related to the concept of eigenvalues. So maybe we'll start that off with a theorem Let T be just some linear transformation then lambda is an eigenvalue of T is the same thing as saying that lambda is a root of the characteristic polynomial. Chi T of T. Okay. So the proof of this is um, if lambda is, uh, maybe I'll say um, let A represent T um, with respect to some basis. So A is just going to be a matrix representation. Um, if lambda is an eigenvalue of t, then we know that 0 is equal to the determinant of t minus lambda i, where i is the identity transformation. Um, but this is equal to just this with respect to any basis. So it's a minus i n. <coughs> but this is precisely equal 
to the characteristic polynomial evaluated at lambda. Um, if instead um, then we know that um, the determinant if instead the characteristic polynomial has a root at lambda, then we know that the determinant of a minus i n is equal to zero and by the colony above, um, this means that lambda is an eigenvalue. So again, we've basically done all the work already, and we see that um, this characteristic polynomial picks out um, the different eigenvalues of T as the points when the characteristic polynomial vanishes. Um, so this has all been slightly algebraic and abstract so far, but again, we should be trying to think of this maybe geometrically. So let's just have an example to work through and think and calculate some of these quantities. So let V be R cubed and T be the linear transformation, which is just rotating um, by an angle theta around the z-axis. Um, so now we can try and think about um, what vectors V are scaled by T and what vectors V aren't scaled by T. So if V um, lies on the Z axis, um, then T doesn't change V at all because it's just a rotation about the Z axis. Then so TV is equal to V and therefore um, V is an eigenvector. with eigenvalue one. Um, but if we think about any vector that's not on the uh, z-axis, then rotating by an angle theta is not possibly going to let it point in the same direction, lie on the same line, unless the one possibility is if we're rotating by 180 degrees, in which case it will point in the completely opposite direction if it lied on the xy plane. So no other vectors v have tv proportional to v unless we are rotating by an angle of 180 degrees, so pi radians, in which case every vector on the xy plane, so with z coordinate 0, um, has tv equals minus v, so is an eigenvector. with eigenvalue minus one. Um, so that's maybe what we get geometrically thinking about it, but we can also do it algebraically and concretely calculate, um, say, the characteristic polynomial. So the matrix of T with respect to the standard basis is given by cos theta minus sine theta sine theta cos theta then zero zero one zero zero. Um, 
And so we can now calculate the characteristic polynomial. So chi a of t will be the determinant of a minus t times the identity. So this would be cos theta minus t minus sine theta zero, sine theta cos theta minus t zero, 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 and one minus t. So we've just taken t away from all the elements on the diagonal. And now by the Laplace expansion, this is one minus t times the determinant of the upper left-hand corner. And that's going to be cos theta minus t all squared plus sine theta all squared um, because we have a minus sine theta uh, in the top row and we can expand this out and using cos squared plus sine squared is equal to one this is t squared minus 2t cos theta plus one so that's the characteristic polynomial for this rotation theta, rotation by angle theta around the z-axis, and the roots of the characteristic polynomial are, well, there's a factor of 1 minus t, so we always have 1, and then we have the other roots are cos theta plus or minus i times sine theta, where i is the square root of minus 1. Um, therefore, if sine theta does not equal 0, which corresponds to theta not being equal to pi, or I guess the totally trivial transformation where it's just the identity, then one is the only um, eigenvalue over R. Um, if theta equals pi, then one and cos theta, which is equal to minus one, are the eigenvalues. Um, so this fits with what we geometrically thought beforehand, but this way we're able to calculate it algebraically very explicitly. Okay, um, good. So um, maybe we'll um, move on to investigating this characteristic polynomial a little bit further. Um, but to do this, first of all, I'd like to recall the trace. Um, so the trace of a matrix Um, which you should have seen in an algebra one is just the sum of all the diagonal elements. And a quick lemma is that if we take um, two n by n matrices a and b, we have that the trace of a b is equal to the trace of b a for all matrices a and b. So the proof of this is simple. So the trace of AB is just the sum over I of the i ith entry of the matrix IB, AB. But we can write down that explicitly. 
that's just the sum over j of a i j b j i. But these are finite sums, so we can just swap the i sum and the j sum around. So this is the sum over j, sum over i of b j i a i j. And we see that then this is precisely the same expansion of the trace of the matrix B A. And so you can, even though A B is not necessarily equal to B A, it's the case that the trace of A B is equal to the trace of B A. And this is important because this means that we can define the trace of a linear transformation uh, as just the trace of any matrix, and it won't depend on the choice of basis. So the trace of matrix doesn't depend um, on any chain on the basis chosen. So uh, let T send V to V be a linear transformation. The trace of a linear transformation is the trace of A um, where A is the matrix representing T with respect to some basis. So again, we have to check that this is well defined. Um, so if A and B both represent T with respect to different bases, then B is equal to B inverse AP, some change of basis matrix. So the trace of B is equal to the trace of P inverse AP, but we know that we can um, change the order of elements in, the, in a multiplication in the trace, and it doesn't change the trace at all. So this is equal to the trace of A times P inverse P, but P inverse P is just the identity, so this is just the trace of A. Um, and so, therefore, the trace of B is equal to the trace of A, and so the trace is the same for any matrix representing T with respect to um, an arbitrary basis, and therefore this is a well-defined definition of the trace. And so, now we've recapped a little bit about the trace, um, we can... Uh, investigate our characteristic polynomial a little bit more uh, to establish that it is indeed a polynomial and moreover it encompasses these two key invariants we've seen the trace and the determinant as coefficients of this polynomial. So a proposition um, for A in and then R chi A of T um, is a polynomial um, of degree N with Lie coefficient minus one to the N, then next biggest coefficient minus one to the N minus one times the trace of A times to the n minus one, and then there's some intermediate coefficients, um, and then the constant coefficient is that a. And that's a proposition. Um, for find that the characteristic polynomial is a polynomial. So for n by n matrices, it's polynomial of degree n. And moreover, it's telling us the zeroth coefficient, the Lie coefficient, 
and the um, next lead coefficient. So we can deal with the zero coefficient first because that's very straightforward. Um, K A O zero is just the determinant of A. So det A um, is the constant term. Um, we see that chi A of T is the determinant of matrix B, where, as before, B is given by A1 minus T, sorry, A11 minus T, A22 minus T, up to ANN minus T on the diagonals, but then everywhere else it's just equal to AIJ. So we have A21 up to AN1. Um, here we would have A N N minus one. And similarly here we would have A N minus one M up to A one two and A one N. So it's just A but all the elements on the diagonal uh, we've subtracted t from. And using our definitions of the determinant in terms of permutations, we know that this is the sum of all permutations sigma of the sine of sigma times b1 sigma 1 up to bn sigma n. Now, Bij is a, um, Bij doesn't depend on T. If I does not equal J, and Bij is a polynomial of degree one, in t if i does equal j. Therefore, if I look at this product, b1 sigma 1 up to b n sigma n, this is a polynomial um, of degree at most the number of choices of i such that i equals sigma i. So the number of fixed points. Um. <coughs> okay, but the identity permutation has n fixed points, um, and any permutation that's not the identity has at most n minus two fixed points. So this means that in this big sum of all permutations, the identity permutation contributes a polynomial term that's of degree n, and all the others are going to contribute polynomial terms of degree at most n minus 2. Therefore, chi a of t is equal to the product of b i i from i equals 1 to n, so that's the contribution from the identity permutation plus some polynomial of degree at most n minus two. But BII is equal to 
just a i i minus t and it's easy to calculate the um, lead terms when we expand out this product. This is minus one to the n t to the n plus minus one to the n minus one times the sum sum of a i i times t to the n minus one, and then we're left over with some other polynomial of degree at most n minus two. Therefore, chi of t um, is a polynomial of degree n with lead coefficient minus one to the n, and next to lead minus one to the n minus one times the trace of a, because that's what the sum of a i i i is, and it then has constant coefficients. What we saw before is just the determinant of a. And so this gives the result that we had. OK, great. Um, I think that's covered everything that I'd like to say today. Thanks a lot for listening. I hope you enjoyed the lecture. Goodbye.